What does attitude have to do with health? Well, Dr. Randy Bivens will join us today to share why attitude is a major determinant of our overall physical health. And there's more, so join us. Good morning and welcome to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for waking up with us here today. Where are you tuning in from? Let us know. Send us a message on our Facebook page and we would love to hear from you. Yes, we would. We love to hear from our viewers and we're so happy to be here this morning. We have a very resourceful lineup today that is sure to bless you in some special way. Yep, on today's program, Dr. Randy Bivens shares why attitude has such a major role in our physical health. Faith for Today will join us as well to share a devotional thought. And Dee Casper from Unseen Media is back to share on bad religion. But first, it is now time to take a look back at this day in history. On this day in history, in 2011, in a ceremony held in Baghdad, the war that began in 2003 with the American-led invasion of Iraq officially came to an end. Though today was the official end date, of the Iraq war, violence continued and in fact worsened over the subsequent years. The withdrawal of American troops had been a priority of President Barack Obama, but by the time he left office, the United States would again be conducting military operations in Iraq. It was a war that left many Americans skeptical and uncomfortable. Lives were being lost and there was a lot of distrust surrounding this war. Did you know that there's a greater war being fought around us? It's the war between good and evil, between Satan and God. However, in this war, we don't have to be skeptical. We can be sure that Jesus and his angels are fighting on our behalf, trying to guide us on the right path. What's more, in Ephesians chapter 6, God has given us the weapons for success and victory. And today we encourage you to be active in this spiritual battle. Put on the armor of God and secure your eternal destiny. Amen. Good attitude equals good health. Bad mm. attitude equals bad, bad health. health? Hmm. Could there be such a direct mm. correlation? Well, Dr. Randy Bivens from Life and Health Network shares more. Thomas Jefferson once wrote that nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. Nothing on earth can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. More currently, the popular motivational speaker Zig Ziglar said, it is not your aptitude, but your attitude that determines your altitude. Attitude. There are literally thousands of studies and articles discussing the impact attitude has on aging and longevity. In a review of 160 published medical studies, it was shown that people who had a positive mental attitude enjoyed better health and longer lives. This link between positive mindset, better health, and longer lifespan was actually shown to be stronger than the link between obesity and reduced lifespan. Let's look at some examples of how our attitude can affect us. One medical study looked at the relationship between anger and heart disease. The participants who demonstrated more anger were found to have 2.7 times more heart disease than the calmer participants. Another study found that people who often felt anxious, unhappy, or depressed were twice as likely to have high blood pressure. And in yet another study, feelings of frustration, tension, and sadness were associated with a doubled risk of ischemic heart disease. Increased rates of heart attack were found in those who tend to worry, with the heaviest worriers increasing their risk for heart attack by two and a half times. The evidence is clear. When we consider these alarming numbers, it is much easier to recognize the pure and positive value of the serenity prayer. The serenity prayer simply asks God to grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. 
So what can we do to brighten our outlook on life? What can we do to improve our attitudes and in return, gain more thriving and fulfilling years of life? Wake up early. By getting up early, we can get a head start on our daily tasks. That will reduce our stress. We'll also have time for a healthy breakfast, improving both our worldview and our health at the very beginning of our day. Exercise will do your brain and body a lot of good. Nature has been shown to have a calming influence on your psyche. So spend some active time outdoors, enjoying the natural beauty that God has created. Plan ahead. When you know what you're planning to achieve in a given day or week, you will have less stress. By the way, this works particularly well if you remember to wake up early. Understand that things often do not go according to plan. Yes, planning ahead is good, but when something doesn't work out as planned, it's important to view the situation as an opportunity rather than a roadblock. Get spiritually connected. As we've shown in earlier videos, having a relationship with God and being involved at church plays significant roles in overall mental attitude and can significantly add to your lifespan. Be thankful. Have you ever heard the phrase, when life feeds you waves, learn how to surf? No matter what, we can always find things to be thankful for. Try spending less time focusing on yourself and more time focusing on others. This sort of outward thinking can go far in improving your own mental health. Spend time around positive people. Perhaps it goes without saying, but we often mirror the emotions of those around us. Consider who you surround yourself with. Make the conscious decision to be around people who will add cheer and love to your life. Solomon, an ancient king of Israel and widely thought to be the wisest man to have ever lived, once wrote, a joyful heart is good medicine. He reiterated this later writing, for the happy heart, life is a continual feast. In our goal to live longer and more fulfilling lives, attitude may be the most powerful medicine that I, as a physician, can prescribe. Are you enjoying today's program? Don't forget to share it with a friend or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up to see more. And search for us on YouTube to check out our YouTube channel and keep up with us. When we return, Hope Harmonies will present a message in song. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Jesus promised that when we follow Him, blessings happen. Ezekiel 34, 26 to 27 says, I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. Hope Harmonies now shares a message and song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to remind us of the one who is the fountain of everlasting blessings.
Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Have you ever been hurt by so-called religious people? Are you struggling to stay in the church? Or did you leave because of it? Maybe you haven't had that experience, but you know people who have. Who is responsible for bad religion? This cinematic message by the Unseen Media Group explores the answer. Have you ever been hurt by religious people? As a result of this hurt, do you feel that religion is just this dead road that leads to nowhere, nothing but disappointment and discouragement and harm? I have some good news for you today, and I hope that at the end of this video, you're going to have a different view, not only of God, but of religion in general. And I think what you're about to hear may surprise you. There's this interesting passage in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 36, beginning around verse 22, where God literally says, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you've profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations wherever you went. And all the nations will know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I'm hallowed in you before their eyes. Basically, people will know that I'm the Lord when you start to look like me, because right now you don't. And it's really frustrating to God that he's being misrepresented by people who claim to know him. Paul picks up on this theme in Romans chapter 2 and verse 24, where he says that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, church folk. He's speaking to the church. Now, this should be good news for you because God seems to be distancing himself from instances in which religious people hurt folks and look nothing like him. So if you've been hurt by people who claim to know God but look nothing like him, he wants you to know today that he has nothing to do with that. But it gets even better. In Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul is telling his testimony to King Agrippa. This is basically what he says. I was on my way to Damascus to arrest people who were believing in Jesus. He's a man who believes in God devoutly, zealously. And because these people don't believe as he believes, he's persecuting them with everything that he has and wants to kill them, imprison them, and make their lives miserable. He's the epitome of bad religion. But on his way to arrest these people on a dusty road just like this one, he has a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ himself. And you know what Jesus says to him? He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, he did not have a warrant for the arrest of Jesus. He had a warrant for the arrest of people who loved Jesus. Here's why this matters. Jesus here is identifying with the people who were suffering in his name at the hands of bad religion. To me, that brings a lot of hope because Jesus has nothing to do with what's being done to his people here. He feels for them. In fact, Jesus himself was killed by bad religion, by the conservatives and the liberals. He can relate. He, he can sympathize with us. It's really good news. He's not responsible for it and that he wants something better for us. So here's my appeal to you. First of all, if you've been hurt by bad religion, know that Jesus has nothing to do with that and that he was hurt with you. Two, our decisions need to be made based upon what Jesus says in his word and how he treats us individually. Don't let other people think for you or deprive you of that privilege. Three, we need to be praying for those people who've hurt us in religion, that they would have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ himself. And lastly, as religious people, we need to pray for the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of humility, and that we would love people who don't see things the way that we do, just like Jesus would, to ensure that they can be reached too. This is possible through the power of God, and bad religion need not be an issue anymore. After the break, we will have today's devotional thought by Faith for Today. We'll be right back. Welcome back, friends. Are you enjoying today's program? What has been your favorite part so far? Send us a message on Facebook and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. It's now time for a devotional thought. This morning, it will be brought to us by Faith for Today. I can remember the first time I was on a phone call and I was interrupted by another phone call. 
Remember a time when you could never be interrupted by a phone call while you were talking on the phone? The people calling in would just get a busy signal. My sons couldn't tell you what a busy signal sounds like. They've never heard it. Now we're not only interrupted by phone calls, but while you're talking on the phone, you can also be interrupted by text and instant messengers and email and Facebook and Instagram and Skype and FaceTime video chats and a host of other notifications. We are bombarded with interruptions like never before. Interruptions, it's hard when they happen. They are one of life's greatest frustrations. Everything's moving along well and then the unexpected happens. But interruptions, are inevitable. They're part of life, and we shouldn't be surprised by this because our God is a God of interruptions. You know, the word interrupt actually comes from two Latin words. The word intero, which means into, and the word rupere, which means to break. So to interrupt means to break into. And this is what God likes to do. He likes to break into our lives. Today, we're going to take a look at how God broke into a man's life. Now, if Joseph's life was typical to the experience most other newly engaged men would have, he would be spending six to nine months of the engagement building an extension to his parents' home, an extension that would soon become a home for he and his new bride. You could imagine the perfectionistic care that Joseph took as he passionately crafted their new home. Am I building it big enough? What will Mary think? Is the floor plan one that she'll love? Or will something irritate her about the layout? Have I considered all the functionality of the space? Are the windows at the right place? Which wall gets the hottest of the afternoon sun? Is there enough storage? Is that section even level? He was on a tight schedule and he had everything planned out. He had circled his wedding date on the calendar and barring any interruptions, he just might get it done in time. While working on this home, he might also have mapped out some other things on his calendar. How would he act and what might he say during the awkward consummation of their marriage? Where would they go for their honeymoon? How many kids might they have? What relatives might they name their kids after? And how might they save up for retirement? And it is in the midst of this mindset that the first interruption came. That's when interruptions come, right? They don't come when you're sitting at home bored to tears. That's not when interruptions come. We would gladly welcome them at that time. No, interruptions come at times when you don't have a spare extra 30 seconds. They come when you're debating which things on your list you can actually drop and still be okay. They come when you have everything perfectly scheduled out, managed and controlled. Right when life begins to make sense, that's when interruptions come. And so, in Joseph's life, that's when it came to. Matthew's account only tells us that Joseph became aware of the pregnancy. It doesn't tell us how he became aware, whether Mary or someone else broke the news to Joseph. But with about six months to go until their marriage, Joseph's life and dreams were interrupted by this crushing news. His fiance is pregnant, and he knows without a doubt that the child is not his. Matthew's gospel tells it this way in chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Before he even had the chance to work toward a successful marriage, life interrupted. His life had been interrupted by a baby. Christ was coming, finally. Christmas was coming. All the world would soon be interrupted, interrupted by this baby. 
God was breaking into the world. God was interrupting not just Joseph's life, but the lives of everyone at that time, and even to those of us to come more than 2,000 years later. Many times in life, God comes at your busiest or most secure moments. This is why Christmas is all about interruptions. It's all about God breaking into neatly planned, tightly wrapped, well-ordered lives and doing something new. First of all, the interruptions of Christmas call you to acknowledge your need for God to break into your life. Go ahead and admit it. You like to develop your plans, routines, schedules, and imaginary control over circumstances around you, and then think that your salvation and security is in these things. If you doubt this, just consider what's it been like for you just these past few weeks leading up to Christmas. Ask Jesus Christ to break in. That's right. Invite Jesus Christ to break into your life and to do what He wants to do. Here's a one-sentence prayer for you to pray every day of this season. Pray this, Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to break into my life in a new way today. Pray this prayer every day with full sincerity of heart and watch what Jesus Christ will do. Look at interruptions not as obstacles, but as opportunities. See them as opportunities for God to work in new and wonderful ways in your life. This is what Mary did, and this is what Joseph did as well. This is what the shepherds did. This is what the wise men did. In turn, they saw the glory of God manifested in their lives. Many of the most significant, influential, and impacting moments of our lives are not on our appointment calendars and pre-planned schedules. This is true for the everyday mundane interruptions of life the unexpected phone call, the chance encounter, the unplanned delay in the middle of your day. Sometimes the whole course of our lives hinges on moments like these. These everyday interruptions may seem like an inconvenience to you, but they're actually opportunities to see God work if you have the eyes to see Him work. This is true for the happy, joyous interruptions of life. Think about it. Who could schedule the moment you first first fell in love or your child's first steps or your grandchild's first words? You, You can't put these important things on your calendar. This is also true of the heartbreaking interruptions of life. Who can know the coming time of the death of a loved one, the moving away of a friend, the loss of a job or financial setbacks or a major illness? These interruptions disrupt our neatly planned, tightly wrapped, well-ordered lives, but they are also stepping stones to a new and deeper life with God. They become some of the most profound opportunities we will ever have to experience the glory of God in our lives. So go ahead, pray that prayer, pray it this Christmas, pray it every day in the new year ahead, pray it right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to break into my life in a new way today. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Roy. And thank you for watching Wake Up With Hope. If you would like to learn more about our program, please visit us at hopetv.org slash wakeup. And don't forget to join us right here tomorrow morning. Ronnie Mills will be back with us. Also, Pastor Mark Finley will share a devotional thought and we'll talk about the God of Thorns. Hmm. And if you enjoyed today's devotional thought and would like to learn more about the Bible, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, that's hope.study. And of course, we can't leave without our daily Bible promise. That's right. Today's promise comes from Psalm 49, verse 15. It says, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Amen. You know, God wants to redeem you from the realm of the dead. Not just the physical death, but also spiritual death. Mm -hmm. He wants to save you from your sins, save you from the pain of discouragement, despair and hopelessness. and, And he wants to make you alive in him, a life to health, to joy, to peace and hope. And he can surely do this. In fact, it's a promise. He promised that he will do it. That's right. Friends, we had so much fun with you today and we can't wait to see you tomorrow. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, when we have promises like this, our hearts are so encouraged. We're so inspired. 
to be able to live with purpose, knowing that there's a God who knows us and loves us and has redeemed us. And today, Lord, we pray that you would keep a song in our hearts throughout this entire day. And we thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer that you love to answer. In Jesus' name, amen.